In this video we'll be looking at homeopathy, the notion that if you dilute pure horse shit a hundred times, people will still buy it. And they do. The origins of homeopathy are perhaps understandable. In the 18th century medicine relied on basic methods such as bloodletting and complex concoctions. Frankly, it was crap. A treatment was as likely to make you worse or kill you as it was to do anything else. Medicine of the time was clearly pre-scientific, with a key aspect being the idea of balancing the four humours of the body – phlegm, blood, black bile and yellow bile. Q. Samuel Hahnemann, who rejected giving people bizarre brews. He proposed giving people a single substance at low doses – noble sounding stuff. Unfortunately, that's as good as it got. Whilst translating a treatise of William Cullen's into German, he duly applied a useful tool – scepticism. He doubted the idea that cinchona bark could be used to treat malaria. Cinchona bark contains quinine, which is an anti-malarial, though not for any reason that gives any credence to homeopathy, and it is no longer used as a primary treatment. Hahnemann ate some of the bark and suffered fever, shivering and joint pain. He'd given himself syncoism due to an overdose of quinine, and thinking that these symptoms were similar to malaria, decided that an effective treatment causes symptoms similar to the ailment it is to treat. This one experience was the entire basis of Hahnemann's Law of Similars, which isn't a law of nature at all. Drawing conclusions like that based on one experience is phenomenally bad reasoning, and not scientific. Hahnemann believed that to avoid aggravating the symptoms of illness, extreme dilutions of the ingredients were necessary, and so he pulled a second law out of thin air – his law of infinitesimals, and homeopathy as we know it was born. In his book, The Organon of the Healing Art, he claimed the dilution process enhanced the spirit-like medicinal powers of the crude substances. Hahnemann replaced the four humours being treated by medicine at the time with the body's vital force, which is really just replacing one misguided notion with another one plucked from nowhere. He also introduced the concept of miasms as agents of disease, not to be confused with the miasma idea which was overturned in the 19th century with the discovery of germs and the germ theory of disease. Creationists might like to note at this point that germ theory is still only a theory. Hahnemann died in 1843 and so predated the main breakthroughs that led to germ theory. As such, he always rejected the notion that illness was caused by anything external. Clearly, based on progress made shortly after his death and since, we know that pathogenic illnesses aren't caused by problems with some vital force woo-woo. How does homeopathy decide which substances treat which ailments? The process is ironically called proving. No actual proof is involved, of course, so to avoid this slight PR issue, it's been rebranded to something that masks its incredibility. Homeopathic pathogenic trials, which due to the injection of extra syllables sounds more sciency, but is also a rubbish name since no pathogens are involved either. Whilst it sounds like it might be similar to proper, double-blind, randomised, controlled trials, it's only a trial in the loosest sense. It's not even testing a proposed remedy for its efficacy against a specific ailment. It goes like this – you create your dilution of some substance, and then you give it to healthy people and ask them to record what symptoms they encounter over days, weeks, or even months. If a number of people get a headache in that period, you simply take it for granted with no basis whatsoever that the dilution is the cause, and therefore also a cure. Never mind that they might just have had a bad day or been dehydrated or stressed. Some of the group may experience some itching during that time. Well, that must have been the potion too. By this approach, something as simple as onion becomes a cure for anything from headaches to red eyes, sore throats, runny noses, sensitivity to light, earache, hay fever, sneezing, urinary problems, thirst, belching, flatulence, abdominal pain, frothy urine, respiratory problems, bad effects from getting your feet wet, joint problems, waking up at 2am and yawning. There is no rationale whatsoever for expecting an ultra-dilution to cause symptoms in healthy people, let alone for that same dilution to treat those symptoms in people who are unwell. It really is no better than going to your nearest voodoo lady 
and having her rustle up some camel crap and bus tickets. Actually, if she mixes up some camel crap and bus tickets in water or alcohol, the chances are she's producing a cure for something, according to the notions of homeopathy. Continuing in the vein of implausibility, we come to the most criticised aspect of homeopathy, the dilutions. It is claimed that the more a substance is diluted, the more powerful it becomes. Spot the contradiction. Hahnemann believed that dilution was necessary to avoid a substance which causes symptoms, aggravating those symptoms in illness. And yet here we are also saying that dilution makes them more powerful. Bollocks 30C is a typical dilution ratio and was the one advocated by Hahnemann. It means that the original ingredient is diluted by a factor of 100 and that is then diluted by a factor of 100 and so on 30 times. What does this mean in practical terms? If we start with the smallest drop size used in medicine today, 60 drops per milliliter, then one drop is 16.7 microliters. That's a drop of water 3.16 millimeters across. To dilute that to 30 C levels in a single step, we'd put that 3 millimeter drop of water into 1.67 times 10 to the 52 cubic meters of water, which as a sphere is 316 quadrillion 920 trillion, 288 billion, 377 million, 454,173 meters in diameter. Or to put it another way, a sphere of water with a diameter of 33.5 light years. And for some reason people think that a little sugar pill with a drop of this supposedly highly potent solution will cure them of anything. This poses the obvious question as to whether they believe a 30C dilution of pure batshit will treat them of their irrationality. The mechanism by which these dilutions are claimed to work is that of water memory. It is also claimed that this effect only occurs when water is shaken. There is zero evidence to support this claim. Any experiments claiming to demonstrate a memory effect have not been reproduced when subjected to proper controls. It's hardly surprising. The idea that water molecules remember the characteristics of a substance has some obvious flaws. There is no compelling reason why water should choose to remember some substance after a bit of a shake rather than the size of the container it was shaken in, or any impurities in the container, or from the air while the substance was added. There's no reason why it should prefer the substance shaken in it now rather than propagate any residual memory of substances the water has been in contact with in its life before being used by a homeopath. The stringent standards applied to water for analytical laboratories specify impurity levels of 10 parts per billion. Using our earlier 1 60th of a milliliter drop, we're talking one drop of impurities in 1666.67 liters of water or one drop in a sphere of water 1.47 meters across. Such purified water cannot be kept in glass or plastic containers since impurities are leached into the water, and yet homeopaths expect you to believe that one drop in a sphere 33.5 light years across has potent healing power. And how pure is their water to start with? We took 70 milliliters of ordinary tap water and placed it inside this beaker. We then took 70 milliliters of rainwater collected from the laboratory roof and placed it inside this beaker. <laughs> Don't ask me why, we just did. Even if we were to grant water the magical power of remembering a substance shaken in it, homeopaths are left with another problem. At typical room temperature, molecules of water are going to be moving around at an average of over 600 meters per second. Which begs the obvious question as to why water moving at such speeds should care whether it is shaken at speeds orders of magnitude lower than that. If memory of a substance is so easily given to water, it should lose or corrupt that memory just as easily. And it can't be that collections of water molecules gang up to remember a substance either. The short structural memory of water has been measured. It lasts less than 50 femtoseconds, leaving homeopaths with no mechanism by which either individual water molecules or collections of molecules can remember substances they have been in contact with. Many homeopathic remedies are delivered in the form of sugar pills. 
Homeopathy requires that first water memorizes the substance that the homeopath wants it to memorize and that the memory is transferred to the sugar pills before the water evaporates. Oddly, you don't hear homeopaths going on about how solid sugar must have a memory. This multi-carrier memory must be retained despite any other disturbance throughout its journey to the consumer and through their digestive system until it can pass that memory and its alleged effect onto the body where it is propagated, without shaking we should note, to where it is needed. The allegedly potentized effect of, say, onions making your eyes stream then has the opposite effect thanks to the non-existent ghost of a piece of onion and a made-up law of similars. Water memory couldn't possibly make the remedy more potent as homeopaths claim. Consider some pure essence, which we'll call batshit, that we're going to make a homeopathic remedy from. Say we make 10 milliliters of solution from the first dilution, and let's assume that with decent mixing, every single molecule of water in that 10 milliliters gets an imprint. Dilute again, now 1% of the water carries the imprint. Give it the homeopathic hippy hippy shake. Assuming that every shake is equally successful, every molecule of water once again has the imprint. The obvious question is, how is the second dilution different to the first? How is it more potent? It can't be. Dilute again so 1% has the imprint. Give it the magic shake, and if every shake is equally successful, then 100% of water has the imprint again. The homeopath is, by any reasonable benchmark, wasting their time repeating the dilution process, even if the concept of water memory were true. Even if every molecule in our 10 milliliters of water had an imprint of batshit, and even if the imprint had exactly the same biological efficacy as pure batshit, by what batshit crazy process can that be any different to just consuming batshit in its pure form? How can it be more potent? The entire notion requires nothing less than a chain of magic, and magic remedies are peddled by charlatans. Homeopathy isn't science, and it isn't medicine, however much its proponents like to dress it up. If it really worked, if the half-assed proving process really matched remedy with ailment, if ultra-dilutions were really able to affect biological systems, and if homeopathic principles were in any way sound, where is the homeopathic birth control pill? A reproducible cure for any type of cancer, or its progress on HIV? These don't exist because, apart from the claims of the most outrageous charlatans, homeopathy doesn't deal with anything that actually matters. And it doesn't do so because it's bollocks. In a future video, we'll look at what it takes to become a homeo-quack and look at more of the arguments for and against it. See you then.